So I'd like to formally welcome everyone to the start of our webinar. And uh, today, this is our fourth in the uh, online conference series that we've been running over the last two days. And we're going to be looking at the secrets of workforce management, how to ensure you have the right number of people at the right time. We've got a lot of insight we want to, uh, want to share with you all. And I'd just like to introduce to you our speakers. So I'm delighted to uh, be joined by uh, Rick Koshiba, uh, who is with uh, Genesis, uh, with the decisions team at Genesis, which is a strategic planning team based in, in Washington. So uh, welcome to the <laughs> conference. Rick, what are you going to be talking about today? We're going to talk about uh, 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 sort of a companion to workforce management, which is the, the longer term planning for, for contact centers. So not planning today, but planning for next week, the week after, out maybe a year or two years or so. Excellent. And also delighted to be joined by Mike Murphy uh, from uh, Genesis. Uh, Mike is a uh, regular favorite on our, on our webinar series. So uh, delighted to have you back, Mike. Great to be back, John T. Um, and you're, a pleasure. And you're going to be talking everybody. about some of the uh, some of the the tools that are available to uh, workforce management uh, professionals. Yeah, and just just really, I want to kind of um, uh, as the kind of work within workforce management has changed, and obviously, multi-channel multimedia is very much part of the the work we have to to manage. I just wanted to kind of revisit some of the. Um, challenges that are there and also if you like the opportunities that are there and getting that organized properly. So a little bit of workforce management for Omnichannel. Excellent. If you'd like to see a, a replay or, or after the webinar get slides of the uh, of the of the webinar, that's available from callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars uh, about a, uh, an hour after we've uh, finished. Just a little bit of housekeeping if you're not already logged into our chat room, I suggest now is a good time to do so as an awful lot of our discussion carries on uh, in the chat room. We've already got 70 people logged into the chat room. Callcenterhelper.com forward slash chat. And here is a link here to download the uh, webinar slides. Uh, if you've got any uh, tips or questions, here is the place to uh, type them in. And if you'd like to uh, use hashtag tip for a tip, then, then if the best tip or uh, will be uh, given a choice of either winning this uh, a nice bottle of uh, champagne in a rather nice presentation tin, or a, a suit, uh, equally good uh, box of chocolates, uh, which we can uh, ship out uh, to you. So uh, just use the hashtag uh, tip so that we know that it's a tip in there. So um, we're going to be asking a question in the chat room. How accurate are your staffing forecasts, and when do you find that they are less accurate? So if you'd like to uh, type that into the into the chat room, I'm just going to start off with a quick poll. And uh, I'd like to just ask the question of how you do your workforce management currently. Do you do it manually? Do you do it on spreadsheets? Do you use workforce management software? Do you do it with an in-house system? Or do you have some other means of doing your resource planning? Now, if you have any other means, uh, perhaps you'd like to put that into the uh, uh, put that into the uh, chat room, uh, which is callcenterhelp.com forward slash chat. So let's just uh, I think we've got most people have uh, voted now. So I'm just going to close this uh, close this off. We've got a sample size of a hundred and forty five, uh, and just going to share the results with you. So fairly evenly uh, matched. 48% of people are using spreadsheets, 40% workforce management uh, software, 6% manually. So a uh, bit of a range of uh, results there. Rick, any surprises for you there? Uh, yeah, the, the surprise is that there's so many folks using the workforce management software. Because um, uh, generally, we, well, there's some se selection bias there, but generally we run into folks who all have spreadsheets. Yeah, I think there's a, a, probably an element of overlap that perhaps some people are using uh, spreadsheets and right. workforce management uh, right. software overall. So we're asking a question, how accurate are your staffing forecasts and when are they uh, <clears throat> less accurate? Um, what we've got is uh, uh, some more results that have come through. Uh, Alison says that uh, 
with within 12 percent taking into account bank holidays and uh, unaccounted absences nathan said forecasting is normally okay within five to seven percent however bank holidays are normally a red herring so it sounds like a lot of people having problems uh, uh, with public holidays uh, samantha says less accurate uh, selling days one to ten of the fiscal month so looks like the accuracy is, is is different on different days of the month i'm not sure what's driving that uh, danny says uh, a forecast accuracy uh, 15 to 20 percent sasha says we're within five percent but technology challenges impact us and sometimes make it difficult so then if that's sort of systems outages that can cause uh cause uh, problems um so a range there of uh, and a number of people who say they're using uh, workforce management and spreadsheets combined. So uh, I'll be talking a little bit about that in uh, in a short while. So in terms of the agenda, I'm going to share some of the observations I've seen on workforce management, and then we'll pass it across to uh, across to Rick. So I just put some uh, slides up on the screen. So I've been doing a, a certain degree of uh, research on workforce management and um, drilling down into some details and some quite interesting. Findings and the first one I want to talk about today is just how calls are distributed now You know if we have an average handling time which we use in our planning of, of five minutes One of the things I found is that people tend to assume that uh, calls are distributed around a sort of normal level so um, You see something called normal distribution. So perhaps if your average is five Five minutes then you probably be somewhere in the re region three to seven minutes well, unfortunately, car calls are, aren't distributed that way, and the more observant of you, who've done a bit of theory, would probably have realized that it's actually a Poisson distribution, is how calls are distributed in terms of the, the range of them. And uh, so a Poisson distribution typically looks like something like this, where there's a bit more of a, a lopsided curve, a longer tail, and uh, a lopsided curve. Well, that's only partially correct. The way that actually calls are distributed is a special case of the Brasson distribution, where a uh, factor called K equals one. And um, the way that actually calls are distributed is effectively called the Erlang distribution, which is the uh, invented by the same chap who invented the Erlang calculator, A.K. Erlang, a uh, Danish mathematician almost 100 years ago. And uh, what he found is that there's a, a very strange distribution of calls where actually not many calls are distributed around the average length. And what you have is a large number of very short calls and a smaller number of very longer calls. And if you think about that, that sort of seems to make sense. You get a lot of you know, routine, relatively simple calls, and then some calls that just go on for you know, very long periods of time. And that's one of the things when we're looking at, at uh, staffing calculations, you do need to, to factor in some of these longer calls. And that's one of the reasons why uh, things like Erlang calculators often appear to overstaff at uh, low levels. Um, another thing I think I've, I've seen, which is quite interesting, is something pointed out to me by uh, Dave Appleby, uh, done a lot of um, planning over the years. And that's that uh, call distribution doesn't naturally fall evenly across the hour. And uh, he introduced a, a rule of thumb, which I think is a, is a great one, which is that um, effectively people make calls often around the hour mark. If you think about it, a TV program uh, is just about to start, so you ring in before the program starts, or a program's just ended, or you're going into a meeting, or you've come out of a meeting. Um, so what he tended to find is that 40% of calls were made in the first 15 minutes of the hour. The, the next 30 minutes only took about 30% of the calls, and the last one is about 30%. So if you haven't seen, uh, so so if you haven't seen that, it might be worth going off and looking at your individual data, and you may well see that pattern. So the obvious thing to derive from that is that a shorter uh, window to look at your resource planning would be quite a good thing to do but one of the things you have to watch out for is what's called overhang and uh, if you look at here here's a plot across uh, 15 minutes and this is taken from the uh, uh, our call center helpers simulator uh, where you see the number of number of calls coming into the center and what you see is that it takes a while for traffic to build up but it also takes a while for traffic to ease away 
And there's a sort of rule of thumb that you, your reporting period shouldn't be really any um, any short uh, any shorter. Uh, sorry, your your um, uh, average handling time shouldn't be any longer than fifty percent of your reporting period, or else you're going to get very significant effects of overhang going through. Um, one mistake I, I see happening in a lot of uh, people who are doing staffing calculations is not including maximum occupancy. Uh, occupancy very level, very simply, is the uh, maximum percentage of time that a contact center advisor spends handling customer contacts. And uh, we all want to make things as efficient as possible. So we, we load up bigger call centers, typically more efficient, smaller uh, call centers. But one of the problems is once you go really above, um, hang on, I'll sit there. Once you go ab above 85% uh, occupancy or perhaps 90% occupancy, two things start to happen. The first one is that agents get so burnt out that effectively they start to take break time on the call. They can't think so clearly, so they prone to make more mistakes. So average handling time will go up. But you'll also find things like wrap-up time will increase, as <clears> will hold time. Someone needs to go and get a cup of water. They will put the quarter on hold and go and get that. So often what you see is that very high occupancy levels, it might look very efficient, but you actually see that the, uh, the inefficiency is hidden in the average handling time. So one thing I would suggest if you're doing your calculations, try not to exceed a maximum occupancy of 85%. Now, something a lot of people are doing, but not everyone, I see it certainly with uh, newcomers to uh, workforce management, is not applying shrinkage. Uh, shrinkage is just basically a measurement that takes the agent away from uh, their ability to make customer contact. So that's things like holidays, staff meetings, and so, so on. The average for the industry is between 30 and 35%. So that's a, a figure that needs to be added into your... Um, into your calculations. And uh, there are two factors of shrinkage. Uh, did a lot of research earlier in the year to try to come out with a definition for what you would include in shrinkage and a standard way of calculating it. And uh, it's true to say, if you ask 12 different resource planners for how to calculate uh, shrinkage, you'll get 12 different answers. Well, we've probably asked about 50 odd people and uh, we sort of came out with a, a consensus uh, a consensus answer to the question, which won't fit everyone, but I think it fits, one size fits most. And there are two factors to shrinkage, external shrinkage, which if you like is out of center shrinkage, and internal uh, shrinkage, which is in center. So stuff like external, is sickness holiday, public holidays, absenteeism, lateness. And then internal shrinkage is all the stuff that happens once someone's actually got into work. So it's going to team meetings, coaching, training sessions, one-to-one, -one, and also all the other things like system downtime, uh, unplanned breaks, helping out other departments or special projects. And hey, uh, we've got an article. Yeah. Hey, well, all I would say is another dimension to look at is, is shrinkage that you can control and shrinkage that you cannot. That, yeah. That's, uh, you know, because one clearly requires forecasting, the other requires planning. Indeed. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's certainly different ways of... Uh, controlling shrinkage. And I think, Rick, you're going to be talking a little bit about uh, shrinkage later on. Yes, sir. Indeed. Excellent. So one of the other uh, factors that um, you may or may not have noticed, but um, a lot of people like to do Erlang calculators, uh, calculations, and you can get a lot of um, uh, Erlang calculators online. And one of the problems is that they're not all accurate. You know, it's their free tools. So who's checking the free tools? And um, one of the things I'd suggest is it'd be very worthwhile, if you are using any tools like this, to actually go off and double check some of the results. So I've given some examples here, just taking an average handling time of five minutes, an 80-20 uh, ratio with zero shrinkage. And here's a table, you can go back to it later, showing what the right and wrong answers to those calculations are. So I'm going to give one example. It's quite a large number, but I think it... Uh, this straight to the point. So uh, 6,000 calls per half hour, five minutes average handling time, 80-20, no shrinkage. The traffic intensity for that is 1,000 Erlangs. So where has it gone there? It's 1,000 Erlangs. So the um, result can't be possibly less than 1,000 agents. 
And to cope with the service level, it has to be higher. The right answer is 1,015, which is, uh, uh, is correct on the call center help calculator. I've put it into two Erlang calculators that come up very high on Google. And here is the answers that are produced. Uh, the most, this one at least took the traffic intensity and added one to it. I think you can see there's a problem here because it's come back with not a number as a service level prediction. So it's confidently predicted an answer um, rather than saying we can't handle it. And in the case of this one, I mean, in that, you know, if you're using this calculator, this is one from uh, I found on, on the internet, uh, that is hopelessly understaffing the amount of people, uh, uh, numbers that you need. So I'd go off and check that. Now, if you want to know why that is, I'm not going to get uh, into the technical technicality, but uh, any of you, uh, this is quite a scary formula. This is the Erlang formula, the probability of weight. I won't go through the whole uh, whole detail here, but if you notice here, this is <coughs> one number to the power of another number. So, so for instance, two to the power of three is two times two times two is eight. And as you get to bigger numbers and effectively correlate with the number of agents, you can see the number gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, you can try this in uh, Erlang, if, in, in Excel if you want. You get to a point where you've got effectively 5.9 with 300 noughts on the end. These become huge numbers and most floating point systems can't cope at that range. Uh, and uh, you have a similar problem with factorials and then you have to divide the two. I don't know why they don't throw an error, but they seem to confidently predict the uh, results. Took us a long time on in Call Send Help to figure out a way around that, which we've done that in the calculator we use. So I would uh, go off and check uh, any calculators you're using that they don't have errors. You can use the table earlier and you can download that from callcenterhelp.com forward slash chat if you need it. Right, quick bit on forecast accuracy. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing forecast accuracy. Here's not how not to do it. So uh, we've got a number of uh, calls coming in during the course of the week. This is the actual 1,200 one day, 1,500 the next day, uh, adds up to 5,000 calls for the week. We've just done a straight forecast of 1,000 calls and look, we've, the actual is 5,000. 5, we've forecasted 5,000. We're 100% accuracy. There's uh, uh, a zero difference between the two, but that is, um, is, is not the way to do it. You can obviously see is we've actually got big variations in it. So what you need to do is you need to take what's known as the mean absolute percentage error. It sounds very scary, but it's actually very straightforward. You just basically take the, the difference between the two. If it's a plus or minus, ignore whether it's plus or minus, and just in this case, take 200 divided by the actual, and that will give you the mean absolute percentage error, which in this case is 16.7%. And you can follow that all the way down. You can add up all the errors and you'll get 1400 divided by 5,000 is 28%. So there's quite a big difference that you get in depending on how you're calculating it. But if you really want to do it properly, what you should do is you should do that on an interval, interval basis. And uh, you can then see that there's a sort of quite a, uh, quite a, a range that uh, you could come up with very similar answers here. So for instance, if you just did it across the day, you might have, say in this case, uh, you're 100 out over 1200, which give you an 8.3 forecast error. But actually, if you did it on an interval basis, you'd be 22.5% uh, mean absolute percentage error. So there's quite a difference. So the bottom way here is the way that you should do it. Obviously, if you want to impress your boss, you might want to report it on the, uh, on the daily basis. But that really uh, is just uh, is just is just kidding yourself. So a little bit there on uh, on forecast accuracy, and uh, just want to share with you a couple of bits on forecast methods uh, before we uh, before we before we break, and uh, just going through some of the methods that people can be using for forecast. Um, there's sort of five different ones, uh, and we've seen already that uh, people have been doing it manually or on spreadsheets. Uh, quite often, if you've got a graph, you need a way of, of some producing some results. So I've got my very latest forecast tool. It cost me uh, £4.50, and it's a flexible ruler. And believe it or not, this is really useful for being able to plot uh, trend curves and so on. I can get a, that's a, I think, a, a 
that's a quadratic, that's a cubic, that's a quartic equation, and I think I can probably get another curve in there. So uh, that's a helix 24-inch uh, flexible ruler, uh, a very effective way of doing forecasting, um, but it is very manual. Above that, what we start to see is there's the most common forecasting method is what's known as the Holt-Winters forecasting method. It's worth looking into, which is also known as triple exponential smoothing. There's all sorts of YouTube videos you can watch on this, but effectively it breaks your whole forecast down into three components. The level, which is effectively your last forecast, the trend, which is the difference from one forecast to another, and the seasonality. The seasonality is the most useful bit. So for instance, what we see here is the difference uh, from the average for the month for uh, the uh, what's called deseasonalized data. So effectively, in January, you get 95% of your average. In May, it goes up. Obviously, in December, if you're in a, say, a business-to-business -business environment, but with Christmas there, you're going to get 74% roughly of your, of your value. Obviously, there's a different profile for people like retail. And uh, if you want to calculate your uh, forecast, then you just basically take your last forecast plus the trend times the seasonality, and that starts to build it from there. The maths does get reasonably complex, but it's uh, relatively straightforward to, to follow. It can take a while to do it. And that's built into worst, most workforce management platforms. What you're now starting to see is a new far forecasting method starting to arrange and that uh, to emerge and that is called arima which stands for auto regressive integrated moving average um, it's the latest kid on the block uh, in forecasting and that's now been adopted by the met office as their forecast method for producing the uh, for producing the uh, the weather forecast and um, the maths on this is very complex um, here's the um, uh, here's the, the all the mathematical equations. I'm not even going to touch touch onto them. I've been studying this for about um, about three or four weeks now, and I'm only just starting to get the uh, get the hang of it. But what it does effectively is it correlates the latest data against past patterns. So, it's, for instance, if there's annual data there, it will compare it against last year and the year before before and it produces some of the very best uh, forecasts you can get but it does take quite a lot uh, a lot of understanding and um, generally speaking that is way beyond anything you can really do in a, in a spreadsheet uh, currently does require some software and I think we're going to see a lot more of that happening within uh, within workforce management software coming out in the uh, in the next few years so uh, just well worth uh, reading up on and uh, having a look through that. And then just a little bit of advice, I get asked this all the time, when should I use work, uh, spreadsheets? When can I use, should I use workforce management? And generally speaking, what I see is, as, as a rule of thumb, spreadsheets are okay up to about 35 agents. You can sort of often manage 35 agents on spreadsheets that can get rather hairy. Above that, my advice would be to uh, use workforce management software. But to realize that workforce management software won't replace spreadsheets. Most people tend to use a combination of workforce management plus spreadsheets for the forecasting element of it. But in terms of the, oh, sorry, it's gone. But in terms of the scheduling, it tends to be a combination. Uh, it tends to be well beyond uh, spreadsheets. And where workforce management really comes into its own is on the scheduling part. So that's um, all I'm going to quickly run through at this stage. And uh, I'll pass back across to uh, Rachel if we've got any uh, tips or questions from the audience. Yes, we do. Mm. Um, I'll share my screen. Uh, Fab, yeah, we've got a few questions coming in. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, so Charlie's asked, uh, we have a very small team, so struggle when trying to use any WFM calculations for forecasting. At what point do Erlang distributions start or stop working? Are there any particular methods or things to look for when forecasting for small teams? John, that's probably to you. Yeah, I, 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 Rick, I don't know if you've got any any thoughts on this. It's, um, I mean, the Erlang distribution does make it more difficult for smaller call centers because you do get the the, the wide uh, uh, wide wide range. Um, 
I think if, you, if you're struggling with, uh, and I don't know if you mean at what point do Erlang calculators start or stop working, I think that there does become a, a size element where a lot of that adaptability you get built into a workforce management platform, reckon, and it's the ability to auto auto feed what what happens, you know, half an hour ago into 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 the uh, intraday forecasts. Uh, the only thing I, I, I'd add is, I mean, he's it, it's it's a serious problem. Small smaller teams, smaller um, numbers are always harder to forecast or plan for, and it's because it's a simple thing. There's just more variability. If you've got a small team that are handling uh, calls, for example and two of the people turn and talk to each other and say, hey, did you see the game last night? Boom, you've just lost 20% of your workforce. Hmm. So, so yeah, it's, it's much, much harder to, to model accurately. So it, it's, it, there isn't, I, as far as I know, there isn't any specific method that, that helps with that. Maybe, um, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe going to uh, larger um, uh, uh, intervals as opposed to smaller intervals. So, you know, looking at an hour as opposed to 15 minutes, that would smooth mm. this out a little bit. And what you're trying to do at that point is just sort of be on average, right? Because again, you're always going to have that variability. That's just the nature of your operation. And that possibly may need to be reflected in the in the surface level targets. Right. Mm. Um, Mahmoud said, uh, how can I forecast when I don't have any historical data and the marketing team refused to share any offer dates? Fire the marketing team. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, good, good luck. If you don't have history, the best you can do is, is use intuition. And this is true also when you're starting a new group where you don't know how the calls or contacts are going to come in. Um, you're always going to have to sort of guess and test, right? You, you look at another group that you do have history on and you, uh, um, you know, try to make your best guess. One of, one of the things I've seen, if you don't have a lot of historical data, you know, particularly you can't get that annual seasonality. But one of the things with some of the forecasting models you can do is if you set the seasonality to three months, so you look to see is there any patterns within three months, and you've really got to try and split what is what is going on and, and what's think what's likely to happen a similar time next year. So is this just month-on-month -month growth as the business is growing, or is this... Uh, compared to last year, but I more than anything else, I'd uh, take the marketing team out for a beer and see if you can get them to share some more information with you. That's the English way of doing it. Yes. <laughs> um, so, uh, Kirsten said, uh, our agents average twenty percent of their staff time in admin duties. Should we inflate shrinkage above the average to incorporate this? Anything above thirty-five percent seems awfully high. Don't know whether. It Either of you had to, had any advice? Uh, yes, the answer is if they're doing tw taking twenty percent of the time to do other things, no matter what those are, you have to incorporate those. And and uh, you know we do see contact centers that have much higher than thirty five percent at times, and it's just because they're being you know uh, ha you know having to do other things. Right. And I, I, I think, think I, th I think the answer to that is actually rather than inflate the shrinkage, you have to include that in the shrinkage. So if that makes you shrink. Uh, you know, 55%, that, that's what it is. Uh, it seems <clears throat> awfully high, but if you actually go off and, uh, and measure it, uh, I'm sure that's what you'll find over the, over the course of the year it will come out as. Okay. So I think now it's uh, time to pass over to Rick, who I think goes into more details on Shrink Hitch. So I'll, okay. I'll pass the bat on to you. Okay, well, let me pop this up. That was a, if you saw a picture of uh, my son playing lacrosse, the world's greatest, well, second greatest sport. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so I'm just going to talk about the strategic planning. So it, I'm out here at the SWPP conference in, in uh, Nashville. And when you ask folks about workforce optimization, you know, what, what is workforce management? It's always about making sure that you have the right number of agents at the right time in order to hit whatever service goals. But there's really two pieces to this. Oh, am I, am I showing, my, showing my screen, by the way? You are. You are? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, great. Uh, there's really two pieces to this. The first is, is uh, tr what's handled by traditional workforce management software. And, and what Jonty was showing was managing the schedules, managing today, managing real time what's happening with your agents, and, and even planning in the short term. If you know, we're noticing our volumes are coming in higher this week, what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after? Those are usually handled by traditional workforce management systems. The second piece, though, we call it strategic planning. It's, some folks call it capacity planning or long-term planning. 
is really really goes to the heart of of um, uh, you know the right right number of agents at the right time. It's making sure that when the door opens up on the build, you know, in the building Monday morning, the right number of agents are are there. You know, we all know that there's seasonality with volumes and handle times, but there's also seasonality with things like sick time and agent attrition. Those those shrinkage factors, and and so you know how, the way that you manage your seasonality isn't through traditional workforce management. It's really through um, your long-term planning process, which again, like John T said, is, is typically handled with, uh, you know, big gigantic spreadsheets. And so strategic planning is hiring plans and putting together budgets and doing what ifs, like what should our service level goals be and what, are, what's the cost of those, et cetera. So, so, um, that's what we're going to talk about here for the next few slides is the, the long-term planning piece. So, uh, there are several, you know, traditional steps to putting together a, a, a good long-term plan. The first is obviously is forecasting, and, and by forecasting, it's not the Erlang equation yet, but it's it's looking back at your history and figuring out what's going to happen to your call volumes in, in six weeks or, or six months or you know 12, 12 months. It's it's you know figuring out what your volumes are going to be. But there are other things that you have to forecast as well, and that, those are things like. Um, your your shrinkage, your agent attrition. If you're outbound calling, if you're using a dialer to to, to dial folks up, it's your contact rates. But anything that might have uh, that 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 you need to note in order to put together a plan, you have to forecast or you have to estimate what you think it's going to be. So that's the first piece is forecasting. The second piece, though, is the piece that that many folks use an Erlang calculator for, which is how I, you have to figure out if you know what the volumes are going to be in six months or nine months or 12 months, well, then you also need to fi sort of figure out how many people that, that translates into. And so um, we're calling it requirement simulation because there's a whole bunch of different methods for doing this, but it's simply taking the tra uh, translating your, your volumes into the number of people required. And then the flip side of that, uh, to put together great plans, you also wanna want to say, if I were to present to uh, my system a plan, um, what would what would the service levels be? So it's it's you know uh, taking converting people into service or or vice versa a goal into people, and so um, you know the things that you want to sort of be able to model are service levels, speed of answer, abandon, uh, customer experience scores, um, costs, revenues, profitability if you're a sales center. If I know how many people I need week over week out 18 months or two years, the next thing that you need to do is you need to be able to say, when and where should I hire my employees? Now, most folks who are using spreadsheets are, are kind of doing this as a guess and test. They look and they say, well, uh, in six months, I'm gonna be, uh, you know, I'm, I need 30, 30 people because we have attrition. So let's let's hire people. And, and you sort of guess as to when, when to hire folks. But the, you can also optimize optimize this, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. And the fourth piece is to take these plans and roll it into a budget. And what you'd like to be able to do is you'd like to be able to, A, make this, this process accurate and optimal, but you also want to be able to make it fast, and that's automation. If you can automate this, there's no reason why you can't go from a forecast to a budget mechanically in, in five or ten minutes. Okay. Now, what happens when you do it well? And uh, I have borrowed this slide from a big company out in the U.S. They're called Optum. And uh, uh, I saw these guys present this at, a, at our conference a couple years ago, and they gave me permission to show this. What they did is they had um, they automated and they put a lot of effort into improving their long-term planning process. Now, on the x-axis, on the slide on the left, they're plotting occupancy, which it, from, you know is a proxy for efficiency, and service level on the y-axis, which is a proxy for service, right? I'll actually click on some things. So this first first bit is is they use uh, workforce management. You know they use workforce management, but they also use, had this kind of um, spreadsheety kind of planning process that they didn't put a lot of effort into prior to this. And then afterwards they they bought a system, but more importantly, what they did is they put a lot of management focus on managing the peaks and valleys over time. So what they would do is they would look out and they'd say, we think we need. Uh, 20 people worth of overtime in six weeks and in eight weeks we're going to need 20 people off of the phone or 50 people off of the phone and they would manage that not the day of but they'd manage it way in advance mm -hmm. so they would plan for training when they need to get people off the phones or they would start talking to agents about when they're going to need overtime and see who's going to sign up for it today so by the time that the day happened they had the right number of people who were going to be working 
And so what you see here is you don't want to be in the bottom right-hand side of this curve. That says that I'm, I'm, I'm providing um, low service, nor do you want to, so that down here, nor do you want to be in the upper left-hand side of this curve because that says that I'm doing it in an inefficient manner. You want to be in the upper right-hand hand, hand side. And so once they put management focus on managing their, their near-term to, to long-term, what they found is that they were hugging their requirement curve a little bit tighter and they were able to both improve um, uh, service and, and do it in, in a more efficient way. <clears throat> Another benefit to improving the, your long-term planning process, again, helping you manage your seasonality, your business, is, is shown here. The left-hand side of the curve, that's service level, and the right-hand side is the distribution of speed of answer. It's a very simple thing, which is, which is once they put focus on this, they found that they were providing more consistent service delivery. So it was, uh, you know, prior, you know, prior to putting focus on this, they would they would find that they sometimes hit service levels, uh, you know, uh, sometimes they didn't, and in, you know, the, the 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 amount of time that they had variability around that was much higher than after they put focus on improving their planning process. You can see it tightened up. They hit their service levels much, much, much more often, um, which is which is kind of cool. It's one of those side benefits to improving a, a process. We typically walk into these things and say, um, you know, maybe we can cut costs, but what they're able to do is actually provide more consistent service delivery. Now, I do want to talk about the Erlang C calculation. There's a whole bunch of different flavors of Erlang. Um, no matter, and, and Jonty brought this up earlier, and I think it's fantastic. No matter what method you're using, you, you're using an Erlang calculator, you're using a simulation model, you're using a workload calculation, the very first thing that you should do is, is, is validate that the model actually works in your environment. And it's a very simple process. All you do is, just like Jonty did, is, is you take what happened last week and you, um, you know how many people you had, you know what your call volumes were, you know what your handle times were, feed it into your model and see if it predicts your service that you're going to provide. And so what we have here is, I, I'm a little colorblind, so I think this is a bluish line, uh, which represents what happened in a contact center. Now, the line hugging it is a simulation model. I'm big on simulation modeling. We'll talk about that, too. And then the line below that is the old Erlang C calculation. Now, we all sort of know that Erlang tends to overstaff, but this is sort of showing you why it overstaffs. It, it underpredicts performance. And the reason it does that is because it assumes nobody ever abandons. And, uh, and hence, it, it, um, uh, you know, it tries to throw bodies on people because it's going to handle every single call no matter what. And so, but it, it doesn't matter what method you use, regardless, what you want to do is you want to go through the process of proving that your models are right. And if they are, publish the heck out of them. Show your senior management saying, look, here's our planning process. Look how accurate it is. And then people will have, um, um, what do you call it? Uh, they'll have confidence in, in, in your, your planning process and your ability to do analyses. What you can see is, is that Erlang C tends to overstaff quite a bit. And this is from a white paper that we have, and we're happy to share it with all of you folks as well. Okay, let me, uh, <laughs> John T wanted me to get rid of this slide. <clears throat> this is the first greatest uh, sport in the world, and, and the reason why I kept this slide and I didn't put a FIFA you know, simulation model out here is because I wanted to educate you guys in two things. One is uh, American football rocks, and the second thing is uh, let's talk about discrete event simulation modeling. So um, uh, it just so happens that in my house I have one of the world's greatest simulation modelers, and that's my son. And from the time he was about uh, 11 years old to now he's 18, uh, he was he spent more time in simulation modeling than anybody on the planet. And what it was is he plays this this little video game. Now, um, a, a discrete event simulation is simply taking information about a thing, an operation, or a, a, in this particular case, a, 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 an American football game, and uh, feeding it information. So let me explain how, how simulation modeling sort of works, which is in this game, um, I, I, and again, I, you, you may not know about American football, but uh, there's a person called the quarterback who generally handles the football. They, they get the fo football first. And when my son is playing this video game, he, he clicks a button and the quarterback gets the football and then he makes the quarterback do something. And it could be he starts running or something. But at some point, he's going to throw the football usually. And when he, the moment my son pushes a button to make him throw that football, what happens is um, a whole bunch of stuff is calculated, Im immediately calculated. And, and what it is is it, it checks the odds of that football pass be, be, being caught by the, the person he's throwing it to. And so some of the things that go into that are things like, is he running as he's throwing? He's less accurate if he's running. Is he being chased? Is he, you know, is there is there a defender right on him? If that's the case, then he's much much less accurate. 
Is it a short pass or is it a long pass? Is the person who's catching the ball being uh, covered by a defender? Is there a defender right next to them? All of these things sort of go into it. And at the end of it, the moment my son clicks that little button, it calculates the odds and it says, uh, because he's running, because he's being defended, and it's a long pass where the, where the receiver, the person catching the football is being covered by a defender, he has a 12% chance of catching this football. All happens instantaneously. And then it rolls the dice, it generates a random number, and if the random number is less than 12, uh, is less than uh, 0.12, then he's ca he costs it and it plays the, the, the catching video. If it's greater than 0.12, well then he drops it and they play the dropping video. It's just a, a and, and that's the way simulation modeling works. So in call centers, <clears throat> For example, what you do is you feed it distributions just like the ones that Jonti was, sh was showing you, the distributions of handle time. And what's neat about it is you don't have to assume it's an Erlang or a Poisson or anything else. What you do is you feed it the actual distributions that you mm -hmm. see in your ACD data, which is much more accurate. Uh, another thing that you feed it is you'll feed it things like what's the, the mean time, that's not even the mean, what's the distribution of abandonment, uh, abandonment rates or, or uh, uh, patients? So how many people will hang up in five seconds or 10 seconds or 30 seconds or 50 seconds or a long, you know, uh, 10 minutes or whatever? And you feed it that information and then you simulate a call center. You, you just simply play a computer game of a call center. And so you feed it a lot, you know, information that we gather or that we gather from ACDs, and then it allows you to do things like say, if my volumes were higher, let me simulate that and see what the results would be. If my volumes are lower, what would happen? If I had high, more people or less people, let me simulate it and see what the results would be in terms of service levels and speed of answer and abandonment rates. So it's a really cool technology to analyzing a contact center. And uh, I would say, uh, if, if you folks are interested in this sort of stuff, please look it up because discrete event simulation is one of the neatest things in the world to, to sort of get a uh, handle on it. And you can simulate all sorts of things. I, I had a, um, I'm not a gambler, but um, we we're having a, a conference in Las Vegas. And one time I was like, you know, people were arguing over, the, you know, different ways of beating Las Vegas. And so I started simulating a blackjack tape no, or a, um, uh, a slot machine and 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 we figured out a way to win in las vegas and i can tell share that but we did it by building a discrete event simulation model all right once you have a simulation model what you can do is you can use that to figure out how many people you need next week and the week after and the week after that but the question is how do you figure out when and where to hire people or when is the um what's the best combination between hiring and overtime and this is a snapshot from a, a from a, 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 a you know our system, but this is this isn't um, this isn't the important part. The important part here is is uh, a technology that's called integer programming or linear programming. If you apply that to your longer term planning process, if you if you look this stuff up and you apply a, an integer program to your planning process, what will happen is um, you will be able to put in place a, a mathematically optimal just-in-time hiring plan. Now, back in the day when I was using spreadsheets, I would, um, I would you know, do a guess and test, and I'd try to figure out when and where to hire my employees. And sometimes I did well, and sometimes I didn't do so well. Now we have environments that are multi-skill and multi-site and multi-channel. These are very complicated problems, and, and it's much better to turn to the math and have the math solve these things for you. So I would have you guys also look up integer programming or linear programming. And what you'll find is, and you know, the kinds of folks who, who sit on, on uh, workforce management uh, webinars tend to be math guys. And so um, uh, us folks who like math, one of the funnest pieces of math that you'll ever run into is an integer program because it turns, it turns a, a, a real world problem into a, a math puzzle. And if you solve the puzzle well, you will save your companies a ton of money. So just as a little hint, please look up integer programming and, and see how it works. It's really cool stuff. Okay. Now, if I have an accurate model, what I can do is I can sort of take it out for a spin. And that's what I'm doing here. On the x-axis, I'm holding everything, well, I'm, I'm plotting calls offered, holding everything else constant, the number of people I have, the handle time I have in my plan, all these sorts of things. And if I knew that my, um, and so I, I'm plotting this curve, and these are very different, um, these are at different um, uh, call volume levels. And on the y-axis, I'm plotting service level. So you can see the relationship between the number of calls that you get and the service that you'll provide. It's, you know, very cool. But um, back to Jonti's point about forecast accuracy. 
What you can also do is I'm doing with those vertical lines is I've, I've added plus or minus 5% to my volume forecast. <clears throat> and let's say that that's my typical forecast error. Well, then what I can do is I can translate that into a service error. So if I know my volume forecast is usually mm -hmm. plus or minus 5% from, you know, using my, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, mean absolute, for a mean absolute error or what, whatever it is. Um, what I, you'll see is that translates into a service distribution of somewhere between a 62% service level and an 84% service level. That says that randomly, if everything else is constant, I can expect that sometimes I'll hit service and sometimes I won't. What you want to be able to do is, is tighten this up. And that, you know, that's the purpose of, of doing better forecasting, right? But let me show you something else. And I think this is also real cool. This is, also, this is probably the biggest tip that I could give you guys. It's this. What I'm plotting on the x-axis this time is shrinkage. And I'm holding everything constant and just varying shrinkage. Now, you can see, and again, it's somewhere around to 35%, right? Um, but what I'm doing is I'm varying it by a raw, I think this is about a raw three, two and a half percent or three uh, percent of shrinkage error. So it says that it, let's assume that I, I'm getting my shrinkage right plus or minus two and a half percent of shrinkage. <clears throat> and what you can see is that the, the range of service delivery, because the x axis is service level again, is very, very similar to the range on my forecast error associated with call volume of being plus or minus 5%. So what I'm saying here, what, what, what the, the point of this is, you can probably tighten up your service delivery much, much more by putting a little bit of focus on forecasting and planning for your shrinkage a little bit better. So it's just, uh, uh, I talked to a lot of folks in call centers and uh, almost all of them spend a ton of time on volume forecasts and a little tiny, tiny bit of time on, on shrinkage hmm. forecasts. Yeah. And if we were just put a little bit more effort on the shrinkage side, you'd probably see much better service delivery consistency. So it's a really cool, cool set of graphs. <clears throat> all right. Um, this is, I think, is my last one. What am I plotting here? Service. Oh, uh, uh, and again, Jonty was talking about uh, agent occupancy. There is a lock. <clears throat> um, there is a a, a ironclad uh, rule for your contact center, which is you can always plot service level against occupancy, and you will always be somewhere on this curve. If I wanted to provide a 90% service level, well, then it means that my in, in this particular call center. Every one of them is different, but for this particular one, my um, my occupancy would have to be an 82%. If I wanted to run a 70% occupancy, my occupancy would be around 90%. So when people, <clears throat> I'm sorry, sometimes we do run into situations where folks will say, you know, senior manager will say, I want a 95% uh, uh, occupancy and I want a 80% uh, service level. Well, if it's not on this graph, you're not going to get both of those things. <laughs> but the cool thing is, the cool thing about it is with simulation modeling, you can plot all of these sorts of things. I can plot service level against cost per call. I can plot um, <clears throat> uh, staffing against uh, profitability and all these sorts of things just because I'm using a simulation model to do it. And I think this is my last slide. Yeah, it is. Check it out. Okay. So th that's all I have, John T. Thanks very much for that, Rick. I think it's some very uh, fascinating insight when you plot one metric against uh, uh, another, and particularly when you're taking real life data out of the uh, ACD system, is probably the uh, the best way of uh, best way of doing that. Um, otherwise, you're just uh, really doing an educated guess. Uh, so, Rachel, I don't know if you've got any any more tips or questions from the um, from from the chat room. We can go through. Yes, we do. Um, let me just uh, pull them up and uh, share. Caught me. Right, there we go. Am I showing my screen now? You are indeed. Fab. So Jessica said, uh, currently my team has limited access to WFM, but we're utilizing this to see what associates are doing throughout the day. Um, so her tip is that this is a great resource to track adherence to be sure the associates are on track. Uh, Nathan said, uh, as we're talking about AHTs and planning, don't use a set average handling time for the full day with your intraday planning. If you run your staffing in 15 or 30 minute intervals, change your average handling time expectations throughout the day. Example being in an inbound sales environment, you may see a spike in sales in an evening. More sales equals more long calls, meaning your AHT in that period is higher. This means that if you run on a day, 
AHT, you may understaff your evening. <laughs> uh, so what are your thoughts on that one? I certainly see a lot of uh, a lot of contact centres where the average handling time goes down in the last uh, last half hour and the last fifteen minutes of the day. Uh, for uh, I'm not entirely certain why, but I think people might be able to guess. <laughs> An interesting thing is for twenty four hour uh, contact centres, you often see in the evenings that the handle times really get huge, and I think it's, it's it maybe people who are calling people just to talk, <laughs> you know, low volumes and stuff. But yeah, I think this is a great tip. Brilliant. And we've had an opinion in from Emma who said uh, shrinkage will change depending how far off the schedule is and what you have or haven't already accounted for. Shrinkage should also be different depending on the time of day. As Rick mentioned, unplanned shrinkage such as lateness and sickness happens at the start of shifts or on certain days such as Monday. However, TL meetings or coachings etc tend to happen in core hours. I think that ties nicely into your uh, into your comment, uh, Rick, about um, uh, you know you you may be able to control shrinkage and when you hold those uh, team uh, team meetings and coaching sessions. Absolutely, yep. So we're going to pass across to uh, Mike, who's going to uh, talk us through some of the different options available with workforce management tools. Yeah, and I just kind of want to take it more from a, a higher level perspective, really, and just remind the audience what we're looking to achieve by utilizing the workforce management tool. And um, specifically what I wanted to do was just underline, if you like, what Rick was talking about with regards to the kind of offerings, because there are actually two separate offerings here. We, you know, Rick showed you this slide on how traditional workforce management systems differ, if you will, from strategic planning. And you know, that, that, that creates, if you like, the, you know, there are separate offerings here for you to, to look at by way of you know, off-the-shelf tools. So from that perspective, you know, the decisions tool that Rick was talking about, you know, can be deployed with other tools and it can be deployed on any platform that you have. So from that perspective, you know, you can think about it in its own right. It's not something which has to be married to other parts of uh, Genesis technology, shall we say. What I want to just uh, <clears throat> focus on really is the workforce management side of things, the, the Genesis offering there. And I kind of want to <clears throat> create this kind of... Um, Without uh, an integrated workforce planning solution, what are the things that we're going to be struggling with? And as you can imagine, things like you know low performance indicators, uh, not meeting service levels, will be typically what we start to to see in the contact center. And then that kind of starts to build, if you will, and and, and sort of have consequential impacts, such as you know an inefficient operation and your costs starting to go up, and you know in a way you're kind of colliding with. <clears throat> You know, overstaffing and uh, overtime, those type of things. Uh, you'll then start to find, like, in reduced employee satisfaction. You can sort of, you know, the the agents get a sense that things aren't the way they should be, and they start to get a bit disillusioned, and they'll just kind of start to switch off, really. So, from that perspective, it does have a have a like a, a waterfall effect, really, on the uh, the overall operation of the business, and and then effectively that increases your costs, it kind of increases agent turnover, and at the same time decreases your customer satisfaction and your operation efficiency. So what we're looking to do with workforce planning tools is to help you navigate away from these circumstances to a more successful and cost-effective state. Other drivers, if you like, for omnichannel workforce planning, and you remember you know, when we were like mostly a call handling uh, business, if you like, or industry, we had a constant. We had like one media type. Today that's changed and we now have multi media types. So the drivers now, if you like, in the omnichannel world, uh, still looking to improve employee and contact center performance, absolutely. The things that kind of get in the way of, of that is the effective use of your teams, the, 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 the right service levels, getting this sort of scheduled adherence. And the way to kind of solve that is with this, this sort of platform which is designed to kind of show you, highlight to you the areas where attention is required to plan, forecast, schedule, and ensure your teams are adhering, and also how you actually route the work uh, to your colleagues. Um, other drivers, if you like, would be reducing workforce planning inefficiencies. So we, you know, that, that sort of notion in the, in the center, there is something not quite right here. So get yourself organized, utilize the tool, uh, do the cross-channel planning, um, inaccurate manual processes start to evaporate, and uh, we can start working with good decision-making and clarity because the, the platform, if you like, has this 
cross-channel forecasting, automation, workload prediction capability built in. Uh, agent effectiveness is, 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 you know, and agent satisfaction will then start to be, you know, become a high priority. You know, getting the appropriate resource matching in place, giving the agent the type of work they like to do, and understanding the type of work they like to do. Uh, maybe, if you like, helping the agent to be developed into multiple skills and in a carefully managed, structured way so that they can develop and become stronger, more valuable. Um, you're engaging the, 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 the colleague, if you like, into an improvement plan. So you can kind of see with the smart software, if you like, we can get better workforce distribution, uh, better in, you know, skills management with your, with your teams, and, and best use of your, of your agent resources. So the kind of points I'm making really are that by deploy, deploying you know, workforce management, we have proven results. Okay? So from that perspective, yes, we kind of tend to go to where we know with, like, with spreadsheets and that type of thing, but you know, when you kind of see results like this, you, you really have to sort of think hard about why am I not utilizing workforce management properly? Uh, so whether it's agent utilization, you know, expect an improvement of 10%, absolutely. Um, the automation and scheduling of activities, you know, again, expect an improvement of 50%. I mean, drastic improvements. And then when you look at overtime expenditures, I mean, oh my goodness, I mean, this is, this is really where the ROI on uh, the workforce management and the planning tools that Rick talks about, you really become very, very, very short. And, and I've seen ROIs coming in like within six months, you know, even less sometimes. So to that end, please don't underest underestimate these tools. Uh, invest wisely in those tools, and it, they will deliver back to you the results that you need to be effective, efficient, and cost efficient. Okay, so with that, Jonty, John I'm handing back to you. Okay, thank you very much for that, Mike. We're going to jump back across to the uh, chat room and uh, see, Rachel, if you've got any, uh, any more tips uh, for us coming through. We do, yes. Um... I've got a, a great one actually uh, from Mel. Uh, change your shrinkage across the year to match your seasonality and your quiet time so that you can add in more training during those idle periods. Guessing that's, that's pretty okay. good. Uh, my, this one's actually one of my faves. Um, uh, if the Met Office is using Arima for forecasts, it's the way <laughs> to go. So, <laughs> <I'm unsure. laughs> Brilliant one. Uh, Mike's asked, um, is WFM effective to forecast and schedule for back office activity? Uh, Mike, are you able to yeah, share I've, with I've, us? I have seen um, uh, some tools, if you like, extend the, the capability into back office, um, but I'm not sure on the accuracy because it's, you know, how do we get this sort of, um, you know, what type of work are these people doing? And uh, is that type of work able to be measured, can we count it, can we get handle time, average times, those type of things. So I have seen some tools, if you like, try to do it, I'm not sure how effective they are, to be, to be honest. Um, Rick, have you any experience based on, on sort of like back office teams? Uh, uh, well, you, I think you're spot on, which is the problem isn't the workforce management tools or, or the, you know, the, the attempt to try to uh, uh, manage your employees. The problem that, we, that folks have is that typically back office is completely unmanaged, right? It's, it's, uh, uh, the users have a lot more flexibility and hence the handle times are, are weird and, and uh, data gathering is weird. But at the moment that you, you do start measuring that stuff, what you find is that the work force becomes much, much, much more uh, efficient because uh, you start measuring something and it improves, right? And so hmm. traditionally these offices have been unmeasured, but at the moment you start looking at things like uh, true handle time and such, it, it becomes much more efficient. And once you start doing that, you, then you can start doing things like scheduling uh, agents. The interesting thing about that is it, it's not so important as when people start and uh, their schedules aren't nearly as important in back office sort of work because the work's, work never goes away. Um, um, but uh, at the same time, you know, you start start um, you know measuring it, and, and handle times will come down, and, and the, the the workforce will will get more efficient. Thank you very much for that, both. Um, we've had a few uh, two more tips. Uh, I think running out of time. Uh, Palash said, uh, if you do not have historical data, it's a good idea to keep about three months' time in the project to collect historical data. Once your system is up and running, and then start with WFM forecasting. So that's a great one from a question we had earlier. Mm, sounds very sensible. Uh, 
Nathan said, uh, if you're working inbound consumer, be flexible and reactive on the day as things such as the weather can have an impact. For example, during the summer, a really nice day on a weekend can lower the actual call volume. Whereas if the weather is a bit rough, this can increase calls as people call in rather than going out. It's something you'll have trouble future planning for, but it's something you can try and manage on the day. Yeah, I've certainly seen uh, people uh, doing forecasts where they've um, tried to correlate temperature against call volume, and then they can look at the forecast for the next few days uh, uh, new, uh, coming up to see if they to uh, see if they can identify the uh, correlation with that. So I'm afraid that's uh, all that we've got time for currently. And um, just if you one or two words, you could describe uh, best what you liked about the uh, webinar and what you like best about the conference, and we'll feed that back into the uh, uh, into our parts. The uh, winning tip, da-da, the big reveal. So the winning tip is from Mel, who says, change your shrinkage across the year to match your seasonality and your quiet times, as you can add more training during idle times, for instance, more people take holiday off during the summer. If you want to watch a replay, uh, it's going to be available probably in about half an hour's time, callcenterhelper.com forward slash recorded webinars. We're going to be back next week, looking uh, in, sorry, in uh, four weeks' time, looking at incentives that work. So I'd just like to uh, say thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to uh, Rick Kosiba from the Physicians Group of Genesis. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Mike Murphy from uh, Genesis. Thank you, John T, and thanks, everybody. And thank you to everyone in the uh, in the audience, and we'll be back in four weeks' time. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.